1967, in their groundbreaking album, Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band, the Beatles sang, I've got to admit, it's getting better. It's getting better all the time. And then John Lennon throws in, can't get no worse. And I've got to admit that that is the song that popped up in my head as I was uh, studying this week's passage. Because for Israel, for the first time in 1 Samuel, it seems that things are getting better. A little better all the time. Because think about what we've seen so far in our study of this book together over the last couple months. When we came onto the scene, when we started up the story with Israel, we met Eli, who was supposed to be a judge and priest over Israel, while they were deeply embroiled in conflict with the Philistines, and Eli was about the sorriest, most low-down, lazy dog of a leader that you could imagine. And his sons, his successors, who were to be the next priests in line, Hophni and Phinehas, are even worse. They're bullies, they're womanizers, they're extortionists, and the list goes on. That is Israel's spiritual leadership when we meet them. But on the other hand, there are some unlikely and pretty lowly people that end up being, although they were in no way vocationally, at least originally, called to the Lord's service, they end up being the most faithful to the Lord. We meet this woman, for instance, named Hannah, who is a barren woman, the second wife of a, of a man from a nowhere town and the outskirts of Israel. There's nothing important about these people because of their bloodline or their, their career, anything else. But she is a woman whose faith and understanding in the character of God are so clear that her prayers utterly change the course of history. And we can see that in the birth of her son, Samuel, who we just read about this morning. In fact, Hannah's prayers were so powerful that we see Mary, the mother of our Lord, even reflect and paraphrase and quote some of those things when she finds out that she too is going to have a son who turned out to be our Lord Jesus. So there's Hannah on the one hand. And then on the, on, in addition to that, there is Samuel, her son, who when we see him in his first story by himself, he's just a young boy serving in the tabernacle in Shiloh under the priest Eli, who is corrupt and, 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 and not a very good priest. He's just a little boy, and yet... The word of the Lord comes to him. And through Samuel, who is a child, the revelation of God is opened back up to Israel. And so that's the characters we meet. That's the scene that is set. And in the last few weeks, we've seen how all of these characters, with their particular characteristics, both good and bad, come to a head when they go to war with the Philistines. And as the Lord promised to Eli, and then eventually to Samuel, he destroyed Eli's line because of their unfaithfulness. Hophni and Phinehas that went to battle with the Philistine army who were toting the Ark of the Covenant as if it were a little trophy or a, a flag or an intimidation tactic, they have been crushed by the weighty glory of the Lord. And the Ark of the Covenant is pried from their cold dead hands rather by the Philistines and taken away into exile. And when this news gets back to their father, it's such heavy news that Eli falls back out of his chair and the Bible says because of his great age and weight, he snaps his own neck and dies in shame. That's the end of his career. But the glory of God that was too heavy and ended up being fatal for the Israelites, is just as fatally heavy for the Philistines. It destroyed their false idol Dagon. It ira ira uh, sorry, irradiated them with tumors. And it sent an overrunning plague of mice into their cities. And finally, after seven months of living under the pressure 
and the oppression of the Lord's hand, the Philistines get wise and decide God's glory is too much for them, so they send the ark back to Israel. Now we would think that that's nice, happy end of the story, but that ends that passage ends rather with 70 Israelites also being crushed by the Lord because they too handle the Ark of the Covenant flippantly. And so the survivors of that catastrophe send it to its resting place in kiriath Jerim, which is where our story picks up today. There's a lot of scandal. There's a lot of warring. There's a lot of irreverence. There's a lot of death. That is 1 Samuel so far. Nothing really good. It can't get no worse, again, as John Lennon said. But for 20 years, we read in verse 2, the Ark of the Covenant, with its supermassive gravitational weight of holiness, has rested in kiriath Jerim, in Abinadab's house under Eleazar the priest. And for 20 years, nothing particularly new or exciting has happened in Israel. But suddenly, without any indication from the author why we don't really know, suddenly a revival breaks out all over Israel. Because, verse 2 says, the whole house of Israel longed for the Lord. Finally, after all these years, Israel longed for the Lord. The author's words imply a kind of tearful longing a kind of sorrowful yearning, a kind of desire for repentance and reconciliation in and with the Lord's presence. Now make no mistake, it took them 20 years to feel this. We read last in, in, in the chapter last week, chapter 6, how they were overjoyed to see the ark in their territory again. It had been gone for 70 years. But it's back now. And they're happy about it. But they still aren't right with the Lord. Their desire for the Lord only comes after long bouts of disbelief and disobedience. But nevertheless, finally, not too little too late, but just in the nick of time, they're ready to come back to the God who's been patiently waiting for them all along. Which is just like God to do, isn't it? And Samuel, who's also been waiting for them, presumably, to long for the Lord, to repent and return to the Lord, is here, ready to guide them in a way that Eli never did or never could. And so in verse 3, Samuel instructs them. He says, well, if you are returning to the Lord with all your heart, not a half measure, not even three-fourths of the way there, but with all your heart, Get rid of the foreign gods and ashtoreths that you have among you. Set your hearts on the Lord and worship only Him. Then He will rescue you from the Philistines. What he's talking about here is true, authentic, actual, genuine repentance. If they really want to return to the Lord, then they must turn away from everything else and set all of their heart's desire on Him. Practically speaking, that means getting rid of every last idol in their life, whether made of wood or stone or in the abstract. Only when they get rid of the Ashtaroth and set their hearts on the Lord will they be rescued from the oppression of the Philistines. And so in verse 4, after hearing this instruction from Samuel, which is a heavy weight for a people that have not been historically good about listening and obeying what they've listened to, they got rid of all the Baals, the Ashtoreths, and only worshipped God. We didn't even know that Baals were in the picture in the previous verse, but they showed their initiative and got rid of everything that would possibly get in the way of their relationship with this God. Church, the reality of Israel's situation in this day and age could very well be our own in our own day and age. See, the problem was not with the absence of God from their land and from their midst. He was within 
Israel all along, long-suffering with them. For 20 years, the Lord had been with them again. And before that time period of, of great judgment where He was away judging the Philistines, uh, He was in the presence of Israel all along. So it wasn't, the problem was not with the fact that the Lord was absent. The Lord was present. The problem was with the people. Israel didn't pay attention to the presence of the Lord. They lived as if He were absent. Israel worshipped other gods and they lived like the Canaanites. And often I wonder, when we look at our spiritual society today, and when we look around and see churches all around us imploding from the inside, could it possibly be that we Christians Two, have been worshiping false gods and our sanctuaries that are meant to be dedicated exclusively and only to the Lord. Is the problem with the chaos we see in our, uh, in our churches and in our individual spiritual lives, is the problem because we have set up idols of our own making? Are we sacrificing at the altar of America, to the false gods of materialism, or exceptionalism, or nationalism, or militarism, confusing all of those things with the gospel of Jesus Christ and His kingdom for all nations, tribes, and tongues. Have we fooled ourselves into thinking that this place, Gwinnett County and the surrounding area, is New Jerusalem when really it's so clearly obvious that it's really just old Babylon? Have we glorified the bales of politicians, whether Republican or Democrat? Have we worshipped at the altar of the asterisk, whatever corporation or philosophical lifestyle idea we may have? And have we, in doing this, neglected the one true God, the Lord, who calls us to live a life of faith and obedience, of righteousness and forgiveness, of grace and of repentance? Perhaps only when we, like the Israelites, truly turn back to the Lord with all our hearts, serving no other ideology, no other agenda, no other politic, no other culture, perhaps only then we will see revival in our congregation and peace in our churches again. In verse 5, Samuel gathers all the tribes of Israel at Mitzpah. Now, this is a small city in the tribe of Benjamin. In the grand history of things, it's not all that important of a place. But the last time that it was read about in the Hebrew Bible was in Judges 19 and 20, which I would not advise many people go read after having a full stomach. It's perhaps one of the most gruesome stories in all of Scripture. Some of the worst Israelite atrocities committed against fellow Israelites was committed here close to Mitzvah. And yet, this is the place where Samuel intercedes to the Lord for the wayward Israelites in one of their most wayward cities. In other words, when Israel is at its lowest and at the place where they've been at its lowest, that's where Samuel intercedes for them. And that's where the Lord meets them. That should give us great encouragement that no matter when or where or what's going on in our life, the Lord can and will meet us there. Even though Israel wanted to reconcile with this holy God, they realized that His kavod, it's a word we talked about a few weeks ago, His holiness, His heaviness is still too weighty for them to bear on their own. They can't come into His presence all willy-nilly, like nothing's been going wrong. They need an intercessor, someone, a mediator, an advocate that can go between God and them 
without them being obliterated. And so, they go to Samuel. And the people are insistent in their newfound obedience, which is a good and encouraging sign. Because in gestures of true repentance and of self-denial, a very selfish people, what they do is they gather up water in this dry and hot and arid land only to pour it out on the ground in this hot desert, indicating that they trust in no other source of water or life than in the Lord. And we read also they fast in the wilderness all day, showing that they believe what Deuteronomy says, that man will not live by bread alone, but every word that proceeds from the mouth of the Lord. So these two staples of life, bread and water, they sacrifice, they forego, so that they might be with the Lord. And on top of all of this, they confess out loud and corporately and publicly with the whole of nature and all the watching world, they confess, we have sinned against the Lord. And Samuel, contra his predecessor Eli, actively presides over all of it. Now here is where the rubber meets the road, because they're having a great worship service. They're having a great tent revival meeting. Probably quite literally having tent revival out there in Mitzvah. But in verse 7, the Philistines hear that most of Israel has gathered in this little town of Mitzvah. And they've not gathered for military exercises. They've not gathered to build up the defenses of the city. No, they've gathered to worship. And so they have made themselves vulnerable. And perhaps feeling a little bitter over what happened just 20 years prior, the Philistine rulers... And perhaps again, the same rulers that we saw, the same five rulers that offloaded the ark back onto Israel, are eager to crush the Israelites. So they rally together an army and they march in battle formation on this unsuspecting and unprepared people. And of course, when Israel hears the rattling of sabers in the distance and they feel the tremors of the ground shaking, as the armies marches forward, they are overcome with fear. Last time we heard about someone being overcome with fear, it was the Philistines that were overcome with fear because the Lord God had come into the Israelites' camp and yet they still defeated Him. So here are the Israelites. The tables have fully turned. They are truly in fear of what might happen. But they do something different from their last battle uh, several years prior. You remember last time, and I think it was chapter 4, when they were facing the mighty Philistines, they objectified God's ark as if it were just some trophy or mascot or something with no consultation with the Lord about its usage in battle. And so they were crushed by the Lord for that arrogance. But this time they do what they should have done all those years prior, and their time of trouble. They asked their priest to keep interceding to the Lord on their behalf. When things got real, not abstracted, when armies were marching on their city, they got on their knees and they prayed. They said to Samuel, don't stop crying out to the Lord, our God, for us so that He will save us. Not that we can come together, not as the Philistines said, now be men and go out there and fight. No, they don't talk like that. There's no no kind of uh, false masculinity here where we're going to rally together and, and stop these people. No. So that He will fight and save us from the Philistines. These Israelites finally understand what we Christians often forget. When trouble comes our way, the first and foremost thing we ought to do is take it to the Lord in prayer. Only He, only the solid rock, only the rock of ages can overcome 
this life and all of its troubles on our behalf. We may struggle and we may try. And by the way, prayer doesn't mean that we pray and then passively sit on our hands and and don't live out our life. No, prayer just shows the right orientation of how life ought to go. That whatever comes our way, we trust that the Lord presides over it. And it's not our own planning, it's not our own scheming, it's not our own brilliance. It is the Lord who makes the way forward for us into the future. And so verse 9, Samuel being a good priest, makes a sacrifice that accompanies this prayer. We read that he takes this young, spotless lamb and sacrifices it to the Lord. And he cries out to the Lord, using the same language of the Israelites crying out to the Lord when they were enslaved in Egypt. And the Lord hears their cries. And the Lord answers their pleas. See, when they had nothing to offer, when they were at their most sinful, when they had done nothing but disobey, when they were at their weakest, economically, militarily, socially, politically, when they had nothing to bring to the table, they simply turn to the Lord and the Lord hears and answers them. And we know that the Lord answers because right in the middle of His burnt offering, not even when it's complete, right as He's in the middle of it, even before it is finished, the Philistines marching against them hear from the heavens the Lord thundering loudly against them that day. By the way, if you've forgotten in in chapter 2, Hannah told us that God would do this and her hymn of praise She said, those who oppose the Lord will be shattered. He will thunder in the heavens against them. It doesn't matter if they're Philistine or Israelite, American, Chinese, Indian, British, doesn't matter. If they go against the Lord, He will crush them with His thundering glory. So we read, the Lord threw the Philistines into such confusion that they were defeated by Israel. Now friends, you can't get much more, I don't think, or much better or more beautiful of a portrait of the Gospel than in these few verses. Let's recount the situation. Here is Israel lost and dead, totally unable to get out of their own idolatries and injustices and iniquities. They were helpless and hopeless. They could do nothing. They needed an intercessor. And they needed someone like Samuel to make an appeal to the Lord to show that they understood that they couldn't save themselves. And all they could do is turn from their sin and selfishness and trust and hope that God would be God to them. And that's what they did. Even when it was hard. Even when it was scary. Even when it put them at a social, political, military, economic, whatever, disadvantage with their enemies. Even when it made them laid bare before a very tough and dog-eat-dog world. They did it. And when the threats of this world became abundantly clear, they didn't turn back to their old ways. They didn't retreat back to their own ingenuity or their own pull-yourself-up-by-your-bootstraps mentality. No! They surrendered themselves completely over to God's intercessor and God's sacrifice on their behalf and God's power for them. Now, in Old Testament stories, And in this Old Testament story, all these elements are different. The intercessor, the sacrifice, the resounding response and power of God. But in the New Testament, they're all the same. See, we're just like the Israelites. We are dead and gone in our sins. There's nothing that we can bring to the table to get ourselves out of the mess that we are in. And every stretch and every metric of this life. 
We are personally and publicly, we are singly and societally deeply entrenched in the power and the guilt of sin, as the hymn writer told us this morning. But, when we turn to Jesus, we find an even better and more compassionate and effective advocate than Samuel. And when we turn to Jesus, we find an even better and even more spotless sacrificial lamb than the one that was offered that day. And when we turn to Jesus, we find an even stronger thundering of God's protection that doesn't simply ward off the Philistines, but wards off and drives out our even more primordial enemies of sin and hell and Satan and death from our midst. See folks, Jesus is all of these things fully realized for us and all who believe. And after all that is said and done, and the Lord, unilaterally and unequivocally, without the help of Israel, wins the battle by Himself, well, all there's left to do for Israel is to worship Him and praise Him and enjoy Him now and forever. He does the work. In America, we love to talk about being hard workers and doing this, and nobody ever gave me a helping hand, and I'm a self-made person, and I did blah, 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 blah. But the Scriptures show us that every good and perfect gift comes down from the Father of lights. Or here there is no variation or shadow due to change. If you have the strength to get up and go to work, if you have the willpower to do that, that is a gift from God so that no man or woman may boast. In verse 12, Samuel takes a big stone probably like the one that came, uh, or that the ark came to rest nearby in the field of, of Joshua we saw last week. And he lifts this big stone up out of the ground, and he plants it, and he calls it Ebenezer. Now, I don't know about you, but for me, when I hear the word Ebenezer, I typically think of a stingy, old, decrepit, Miser from a Victorian era ghost story that's set around Christmas time. But there's nothing scroogely about this Ebenezer. In fact, this Ebenezer or Ebenezer literally means Eben, the stone, Azer of help. The stone of help. Samuel says that this stone of help symbolizes how the Lord has always helped His people and how He always will. Now what I find so powerful about this particular phrase, this stone of help, azer being the important word there, is that it is only used once of a human being in all of the Bible. And that's for Eve. Eve is the azer of Adam. Without Eve, Adam was incomplete. He needed a helper. He needed a completer. He needed a rescuer to help him fully inculcate the image of God. It wasn't just Adam as the image of God, but Adam and Eve. Together, they are the image of God. And he needed her for him to be complete. But every other time the word azer is used, in the Old Testament. It is referring to the Lord. Especially in the Psalms. When you read these different Psalms, that word appears alongside of describing the Lord, also describing Him. The Lord is our shield. He's our protection. The Lord is our rock. He's our foundation and our stability. The Lord is our azer. He is our help when we have no other help. 18th century Baptist hymnist Robert Robinson was really struck by this word and this image, which, he, which is why he wrote about it in this famous hymn that we sang this morning, Come Thou Fount. He says, Here I raise my Ebenezer. 
Here I raise my stone of help to remind me that hither by thy help I come. Only by, only by your help, Lord, do I make it this far in life. And I hope that by your same good pleasure, safely to arrive at home. Not my home in Loganville or Lawrenceville or Gainesville or any other ville around this area, but my home with the Lord forever. When we worship as Christians, every Sunday what we're doing together is raising our own Ebenezer. Our own stone of help. It is a monument showing each other that by this rock, this is the only way that we come home. It's only because Christ is the greater Ebenezer. Because Christ is the greater rock of ages. Because Christ is the greater solid rock on which we stand. That we can withstand all the terrible enemies of this world. Not just the Philistines, but the cancer, the dementia, the betrayal, the despair, the poverty, the violence, the sin with all its guilt and power. It was only by this Lord and by His gracious help that the Philistines were subdued. And it's only when the heavy weight of God's glory is for us and against our own personal Philistines that we can truly say with Paul, who can be against us if this rock is for us? The Lord's hand will be against our every spiritual and existential foe. And folks, forget not that Paul says we don't wrestle against flesh and blood. Republicans and Democrats are not your enemies. Socialists and capitalists are not your enemies. Americans and non-Americans are not your enemies. Your enemies are sin and death. They may work through all of those entities, but that is ultimately what we struggle and wrestle against. But the Lord's hand is against all of those things that crush us because the Lord's hand was first raised up and nailed to a cross for sinners like us. Black and white, male and female, old and young, rich and poor. And no city, no society, no nation, no administration will be left standing against the Lord's people. Whether it's the cities of Ekron or Gath, the cities of Washington or New York, the cities of Moscow or Beijing. As Augustine reminded his, his faint-hearted parishioners, as, as members of the Roman Empire that were watching as the Goths and Visigoths were coming down and sacking and sieging the Roman Empire and this great Pax Romana, this great way of life, our American culture was under assault. And he reminded them that the city of man may fall, Rome may fall, but the city of God will never be assailed. And that's where your citizenship lies. At the end of our passage, we're left with Samuel judging Israel all throughout his life. Meaning that he would go on a circuit like an old-timey Methodist circuit rider and preacher. He'd go to Bethel, to Gilgal, to Mitzpah, and back home to Ramah, helping all of Israel with all of her needs, judging righteously and helping them to worship. And then even when, he was, when they were left on their own, he had an altar built at his home so he could make sacrifices for them there. And that's how our passage ends. Things have gotten better. But sadly, even though this is where the story closes and our service will close for now, and it does end like that Beatles song. Things are got, getting a little better all the time. Next week and next chapter, unfortunately, I hate to tell you this, folks, in spoiler alert, but it all comes crumbling down again. Because Israel, in all her pride and envy, Israel, who is so faithful and repentant this chapter, 
Well, next time, she will beg for a human king and reject God, who's delivered her from Egypt and from the Philistines and eventually from the Babylonians and the Persians and the Assyrians. Well, they won't want that God as king. They'll want a man just like them as king. And this is both tragedy and travesty. But the stone of help, the Ebenezer, still stands where the people fall. And this Ebenezer, this stone of help, this Lord who loves His people doesn't give up on His sinking sand Israelites. (laughs) Like He doesn't give up so easily on us. Saul may be coming to the throne shortly, but Jesus is coming back even sooner. And it may, and it rather, it is on that solid rock that we, as shaky as we are, may stand both now and until he returns. Let's pray. Lord, here we do indeed raise our Ebenezer. And it's here by your help that we do come. And we trust in the Lord Jesus that one day in Him we all safely will arrive at home. For it's in His name that we pray and ask all these things. Amen.